Today on The Real Story, a special session on a controversial decision extending Governor Lamont's emergency powers. Plus, what's happening with juvenile justice reform? We're going to talk with Senate leaders, Senate President Pro Tempore Martin Looney and Deputy Senate Republican Leader Paul Formica. Plus, a big nomination, Sarah Bronin nominated by the Biden administration to chair the U.S. Advisory Council on Historic Preservation. So what does that entail and where is she in the process? Sarah Bronin is our guest. It's all today on The Real Story. And thanks for joining us on The Real Story. I'm Jen Bernstein. Well, this past week, the House and the Senate met in Hartford to decide whether to extend the governor's emergency powers, which he was granted during the COVID pandemic. And both the House and the Senate approved the extension for another time. Now, it was supposed to give him the power to make quick decisions that could save lives at a time of uncertainty. And when our government was essentially shut down, the legislative session put off because of the pandemic. But now the legislators are meeting and we've got a better handle on the pandemic. So Republicans say, why does the governor need that power? We want to hear from both sides right now. Joining us this morning, Senate President Pro Tempore Senator Martin Looney from New Haven and Deputy Senate Republican Leader Paul Formica. Thank you, Senators, both for being here. Good morning. Great to be with you, Jen. All right, so let's start with you, Senator Looney. Why does the governor need these powers and why did you grant him those powers this week? Uh, first of all, because we are still in a pandemic uh, crisis and there are times when the executive is the only uh, branch of government able to act very quickly. The legislature is a deliberative body, has a process it has to go through, uh, and there are times when the executive needs to be able to act in a, uh, in a very quick response way should a, a crisis erupt that is uh, very time sensitive. However, we did pass legislation in the last session that will give the leadership of the General Assembly a chance to review every single executive order uh, issued by the governor and a chance to uh, to disapprove those orders by a vote of the, the majority of the six leaders of the General Assembly. But I would like to just uh, say a, a metaphor for the situation we've uh, faced since March of 2000. It's almost like a, a ship that capsized, and that was the situation we were in in March of 2000. People were in the water treading without a life preserver, and uh, uh, some perished during that time. Others who were strong or fortunate uh, survived, and then uh, life preservers uh, emerged in the form of the vaccine that became available near the end of the year. Uh, that was a significant help. Then as the vaccine uh, became extended to more people and more people were able to uh, to possibly uh, benefit it, uh, then that is the equivalent of where we are now, I think, getting into a small uh, lifeboat. So people have life preservers in a small lifeboat, but uh, there may be a dangerous wave coming at us in the form of the, the Delta, vac the, the Delta uh, variant. And uh, we, don't, we don't have a lot of provisions in the boat and we don't know how far we are from land. And we don't know whether we're going to be picked up soon by a, a larger ship. So uh, I think to say that the worst is uh, over and the worst is behind us and we've uh, weathered the storm and it's waned, it's far too soon to say because this week, as we know, uh, the uh, positive rate went up to 1.28% of those tested uh, for the first time in a month. It has actually more than doubled the rate of what it was when it had bot hit its bottom uh, level. So I think to be prudent, uh, we needed to do what we did this week uh, to give the governor the authority to act when necessary, but also maintaining a strong opportunity for legislative oversight. So Governor Lamont's going to have these additional powers until September 30th. I think it's a 70 additional days, and then you're going to revisit, it sounds like. Senator Formica, you all have been pretty adamant uh, when each of these was re-upped that this is not needed anymore. Your reaction to the vote that happened last week? Well, thank you, uh, Jen. And, you know, I served uh, in East Lyme as first selectman during uh, the major hurricanes. So, you know, I understand the need for having a chief executive uh, to be able to hold the reins on the ship and uh, move decision making forward very quickly. Uh, we were all on board with that early on when we didn't know what was up, at, what we were up against. Uh, but as the situation progressed, uh, as the state began to move forward with things that would protect our citizens, and we learned about mask wearing and hygiene. Uh, you know, the, uh, the, the vaccination rate uh, in Connecticut is one of the best in the, in the nation. And, you know, we, 
we know that the governor and others have worked hard to make sure that that's moving forward. Uh, however, we are in the waning point of this pandemic. Uh, while there still is a pandemic and we still need to be wary, uh, I think it's time that the legislature can participate uh, in this. Uh, you know, the governor called the special session to talk about the uh, extension of the powers earlier this week. We were able to respond within a few calendar days, and, and we all met uh, in Hartford to make this decision. The same thing, I believe, can occur in a timely fashion uh, to handle any emergency that comes up, because we've pretty much been through the, the worst of it, I think. And uh, as the vaccination rate climbs and people tend to get more vaccines, uh, I think it's going to be uh, less and less uh, of a critical emergency. Senator Formiga, I'm curious, is it about the principle that he has more power in, in his role, or is there something specific that he did also during this pandemic that was concerning with those extended powers? No, I think I think it's the it's the principle of you know extending the powers now uh, being the same as they were 16 months ago. The, the same powers are being extended, um, and it's the legislature have been sitting back uh, to to a large extent. We've been supportive of all the initiatives that the governor has put forth. We had some questions about the handling of nursing homes and others, but you know that's going to happen in an emergency. Uh, now, I think the legislature is primed and ready to act. I think we can act uh, on some of uh, these events that are moving forward and, and uh, assist in, in doing the job that we were elected to do, and that is get the voice of the people back uh, to the state house, and, you know, not have the governor uh, being the sole voice, uh, you know, managing this entire pandemic. Now, uh, we know that uh, Governor Lamont did talk about why he wanted these extended powers before you all voted. I want to play a piece of an interview we did with him just to hear his explanation since this is what we were talking about. There are some important reasons that you keep these emergency powers. You're right, though. If the legislature said, I'd like to... Um, you know, make sure that, um, you know, eviction appeal period goes a little bit longer. They could have done that. They didn't do it, so I had to do that under the EO. So they're a very narrow group of reasons why I want to continue this. And they can veto any executive order they want on a very timely basis. They haven't chosen to do that yet, and I appreciate it because it's important what we're doing. They'll continue the emergency powers in a very uh, a discreet set of uh, EOs specifically related to imminent things on public health. So it's a, it's a narrow continuation going forward. Look, the emergency powers are also important so we continue to get full funding of FEMA. If you don't have those powers, we lose a lot of that federal funding. So, Senator Looney, explain this to me. Why does the governor having those extended powers keep that FEMA money rolling into the state? Well, part of it is that uh, some of it depends on having a, a declaration of emergency uh, in place. There are some states uh, that have found ways around that, perhaps by having a limited declaration. Uh, but the, the best way to guarantee the FEMA money, which is substantial, as well as SNAP funds for uh, uh, for food for low-income families, is to have the declaration in place. But we are uh, still in a 16-month uh, long process that began in March of 2020. We're now 16 months into it, and we cannot predict that we are near the end of it or not. We hope that we are. Uh, but to say that we are, I think, is more aspirational uh, and hopeful rather than based upon fact and reality. Senator Formica, your final thoughts on this before we talk about juvenile justice reform. Well, you know, I, you know, he spoke of hurricanes early on. You never know when uh, emergencies are going to strike. And, uh, you know, we were able to uh, implement emergency powers. And I think should something jump up uh, that would measure to the level of, of a true greater emergency than we're in now, I think we could you know, we could move forward and the governor could enact emergency powers. But right now, we are the only New England state uh, that has continued to extend these powers. So all states surrounding us have not. And the chair of the Appropriations Committee in testimony earlier this week indicated that there are ways for the state to get supplemental staff money and, uh, and housing money uh, from FEMA uh, without the need for this emergency declaration. And, and I think... The legislature is ready. Nobody wants to leave any money on the table, especially if it impacts uh, our citizens. Uh, so, uh, but I think that the legislature can and is ready and willing to act in assistance uh, to move this forward. And I think the time is right 
uh, for us to be back involved. Senator Looney, I do have one more question, actually. Have you spoken to the governor about the possibility of extending after September 30th? Uh, no, it's important to note that the statute authorized the governor to seek a, a six-month extension uh, from the expiration of the current order, which is July 20th. It could have gone to January 20th of 2022. But in fact, I think he's been very judicious in the use of his powers and only asked for a 70-day extension uh, to uh, the end of September. So so um, we will be going through this whole process again in mid-September, I think. At that point, uh, the governor will evaluate uh, conditions as they exist then uh, and either request or not request an extension, and we will either grant or not grant an extension uh, at that point. And uh, by then, we should have a, a, a sure uh, sense about whether the, uh, the Delta variant or anything else is threatening us at that point. All right, I want to switch over to juvenile justice reform. We don't have a ton of time for this. I mean, we could do a full hour-plus show on the issue of juvenile justice reform. But, uh, Senator Looney, you were highly critical of Republicans coming out a few weeks ago uh, saying that something needs to be done in our state with juvenile justice. Uh, you know, is that something at all you're looking at, or do you, you aren't entertaining it remotely? Uh, well, first of all, I think that uh, the, the issue of uh, Republican concern about crime goes back to the, the very largely disturbing silence of most Republicans, both at the national and state level, about the, the travesty that we saw on January 6th in Washington, D.C., uh, an attempt to subvert and undermine our Constitution. Uh, that is lawlessness of the most reckless and dangerous kind. Uh, and unfortunately, the Republican Party at all levels has been generally silent on that. But regarding juvenile crime, uh, I think that the issue of card thefts is certainly a problem. Uh, the overall, the larger crisis is uh, crime by young people in particular, uh, notably homicides occurring largely in the urban areas, which have also uh, increased uh, this year and also during the, the pandemic. And I think the answer to that is uh, 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 more resources in terms of, of uh, uh, counseling and, and deterrence, uh, and also probably uh, a greater use of electronic monitoring uh, for offenders, for juvenile offenders, because many of them are unsupervised. Many of them come from homes where there is not adequate supervision, which is why they got into trouble in the first place. And frankly, our state courts uh, use electronic uh, bracelets and monitoring services much less than the federal courts do with federal defendants. And I think that's an area where we can possibly move. Okay. Senator Formica, I know this is something that you all wanted to happen during a special session that hasn't happened yet. It sounds like, though, Democrats do want to do something on it, is what I'm hearing from Sen Senator Looney. Uh, what do you think needs to happen? Is it, is it in time enough if we wait until the next legislative session? Well, the, the, the first thing that needs to happen is that we need to have conversations with each other and not go backwards about what happened on January 6th. I can say that uh, Senate Republicans in the state of Connecticut came out against uh, what happened on September 6th, uh, uh, January 6th, I'm sorry. And, you know, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about juvenile crime that's up. We're talking about homicides in New Haven up over 65 percent. Hartford on its, on its way to have its deadliest a year and decades uh, as a result of the homicide rate going up. And Connecticut's homicide rate is up 30 percent. And you could argue it's the failed policies of the Democrat majority uh, that, that uh, they put through in the cities that, not have, that have not held leaders of the cities accountable. And, it, and it's time to do that. Uh, the Republicans put forth a couple of bills, Senate Bill 550, that would have created a community investment board that would have helped direct money into neighborhoods to make sure it was going in the right place to the right kids, to make sure uh, that they had an opportunity uh, to get out of this generational poverty that they're in. Uh, and, you know, also uh, the 440 would have created a job pipeline. Uh, and these bills were not even uh, let out of committee for discussion on the floor. So, you know, w we want to stop this crime wave. We need to stop this crime wave. Republicans in Connecticut believe that it's a true emergency and it should be afforded the same opportunity for discussion as we did this week on extending the governor's powers. And, and I don't believe that that's asking too much. Senator Looney, reaction to that? And, and is this something that you would wait for until the next legislative session, or is that something you'd visit this summer or this fall? Well, we uh, are likely to have another session uh, uh, in the fall because we still have to allocate the remainder of the uh, federal ARPA money that uh, uh, was not uh, dealt with in the, the budget that we passed. It's about $240 million. So uh, uh, Speaker Ritter and I will have discussions as to whether or not uh, uh, the subject matter of that session uh, could, be, uh, could be enlarged to cover something on, on this subject or others. All right. Senator Martin Looney, Senator Paul Formica, gentlemen, thank you so much for joining me this morning on The Real Story. Always good to hear from both of you. 
Thank you. Thank you, Jen. Have a good morning. All right, ahead on The Real Story, a presidential nomination in Hartford. Sarah Bronin picked by President Biden to serve as the chair of the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation. It's a big deal, and we're going to talk about it with Sarah Bronin herself right after the break.